creator, the creator and founder of You Can Become. And he's going to share his story with us now. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> All the remotes over there. All right, all right. All right, sweet. There we go, there's me. So, <laughs> I know it's a good looking chap, isn't it? <laughs> but, um, anyway, my name is Jack Nolan, and today I'm going to share my story with you guys to hopefully inspire some of you, motivate some of you, and empower some of you guys, and share a few lessons that I've learned along the way through my experiences that I've lived through in my life. So, I want to say thank you for being winners. There's a hundred and one reasons today why you could have not turned up. You might have felt, you know what, I don't want to get out of bed this morning. I'm not feeling too well. I've got anxiety. My heart's beating 100 miles an hour. A little bit like how I'm feeling right now. <laughs> and there's a, um, you know, you might have had an argument with your partner. You might, your kids might have had a bad night and there's loads of situations that have gone on. You know, there might have been an accident on the motorway like there was this morning, but I might stress you out a little bit on the way to get here to work. So I want to say thank you for being winners because being a winner is showing up. And that's what's important about being a winner in life. You know, no matter what you're going through, no matter what your circumstances are, in despite of all that stress, you show up. So I'm going to jump into the deep end and share with you a poem, what I've written when I was in a really bad place, when I was in a really dark time in my life a few years ago. And it's got some life lessons in there, what I've started to realise through looking back on it, and it goes like this. It's easier to be a spectator, to sit on the couch and watch something greater, when a lot of work goes unseen. People underestimate the power of a man's dream. They believe in the wrong ideologies, questioning why they can never be. When a lot of work goes into the dark that's never seen, that's why people curse and say that life's mean, that it's done them wrong. While the other man's working all day long, from spectator to hater, false beliefs don't make them any greater. I'm the type of guy to slay down any slater. Just look him in the eye and define them as a hater. Stone cold walls chained to a cell. I'm seeing people chasing money and it doesn't end well. That's why gangsters die or end up in hell. You see, I'm too defined with blood money in my past. I'm the new breed, here to last. So if you want to get to know me, pull up a seat. You see, I'm a storyteller and I can tell you about beef. But my lessons and experiences exist for a reason, not just a gig. For in the shh, jokes, calling the stick. Unknown and you'll never know who I am. I'm not voice of power, the definition of a true man. I teach, I preach and I lead the way. I exist for that kid is too quiet to say. Because one day he will wake and he will become something. Just like you guys here at Barclays. And it's an amazing what you guys are doing today. Putting events on about mental health and spreading awareness. That is such a massive thing that a lot of businesses are not really taking advantage of to help their staff and change in their culture. So what I say, thank you for like what you do here at Barclays. It is massive and it's an amazing achievement. So, <laughs> so my story starts from the beginning. And it was a very long time ago. I was in primary school. Now I know that was a while ago for a lot of you guys, but for me it was about... <laughs> it was about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> so in primary school, I used to get picked on, I was bullied, I was shy, I was scared. I'd get upset all the time. And it was, I was dealing with a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress. And I used to have like little panic attacks about going into school in the morning. I didn't want to go and fight with my parents. And I'd say, I don't want to go, I don't want to go. But they dragged me to school. And then I'd get picked on and bullied, and I'd have teachers say to me, Jack, you're never going to be successful in life if you carry on going like the way you are right now. You know, but she reinforced it quite big, that I'd never be successful. And it stuck with me, this toxic belief. So as I got into high school, I had to change it all. I had to reinvent myself and say, you know what, I'm going to let the past be the past. I'm going to be the best thing I can be in the future. So I started to try and like really give everything I've got to like being the best version of me. And it all started with changing my beliefs. I had to change my belief, what this teacher put in me, that I'd never be successful, and change it to that I will be successful, that I will be the creator of my own future, that I will give my best in everything that I do. So all the teachers at high school started saying to me, Jack, you need to get this thing called maths. And maths wasn't my favourite subject, and it wasn't the best thing, as you are, can probably 
realised when you was going back in time to maths class. Mm -hmm. And it was hard for me to like really connect the dots why maths was so important. But anyway, I started knocking on the maths teacher's doors and saying, look, can you help me then with this maths thing you keep going about? And I said, no, no, you've got to stick to the programme, stick to the programme. But then eventually, I got a maths teacher to believe in me after knocking on the door a few times and getting a few no's that he actually believed in me and seen the passion in me to what I better myself, that he'd give me an extra year of his time to learn maths. So, how does this sort of link to mental health? Well, in life and mental health, whether you've got a mental health problem or not, you've got to be persistent, and this is where I learned my first valuable lesson in life. I could have just accepted the no's and accepted that I wasn't good at maths, but I made a conscious effort to try and better myself in maths. So after a year of training like Rocket, you know, like punching left, <laughs> punching back, I'm in the ring, you know what I mean? There's all that sort of stuff. And then, um, it's all metaphors for life, you know what I mean? So it was like fighting these battles. And then, come exam day, I got a D. I failed. I thought I put all this extra effort in, I've, I've sacrificed, I've, I've done all the things that people, you know, should do. I've, I've gone after school clubs and I've gone to everything and I've stopped chasing girls and I've stopped chasing all other sort of social things that normal kids do and I've sacrificed so much and I still failed but then I thought you know what this day has got to mean something to me I had a thing for a moment and I thought what could it mean? I thought it means determination Jack it means discipline it means domination it means putting forth effort every single day and doing what's right all these things that let her in common and there was a D. And I thought, yeah, it works that. It works for me. I might not have a C, you might not be C for clever, or B for brilliant, or A for A's, but D for determination is something that I can truly connect with, because I put in so much. And with my mental health, I was suffering with the anxiety, I was suffering with the depression without realising, but again, showing up and believing in myself was a massive thing for anyone with a mental health problem that was undiagnosed. And I was even suffering with dyslexia, that again was undiagnosed at the time. But I was like scraping away from the school system, giving it everything I could get. So eventually, I ended up getting into college, came up with some Ds there, but this time it was distinction, so that was like an A. <laughs> I thought, there's something going on with this letter D, isn't there, in my life? <laughs> but then um, I ended up getting, you know, going on to having a careers advisor say to me some negative things that really sort of affected me. She went, Jack, due to your grades, due to your circumstances and due to your situation, it's unrealistic for you to believe you're going to be an author, a writer, an actor, a creative person and go on to do these great things. Just set off for something normal. I said, listen, miss. It's unrealistic to walk into a room and flip a switch and a light to come on, but fortunately, and this didn't think so. I said it's unrealistic to you know board a plane, fly across to another country, but fortunately the Wright brothers didn't think so. So you can imagine that conversation went down. I left the room and I thought, yeah, I've shown her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna to tell her what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna write a book. Yeah, I've shown her. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> but um, yeah, I thought you know I'll, I'll show that person one day that I'm gonna create whatever it is that I want to create, and it's not of the grades that get me there, but it's me as a person that will get me there. Because the, per the most important thing is about chasing grades and chasing goals and chasing everything that you want in your life, whilst dealing with mental health problems and stupid learning difficulties, is you. It's you're the person who's going to have to try to get up in the morning and fight your own battles. The grades on a piece of paper are not going to do that for you. The, the titles and the things that you collect along the way, it's not going to do it for you, it's not going to motivate you, you've got to motivate you. And when you've got a mental health problem, such as I have, which is called bipolar, it's a fight every single day. Every single day, is it. I take it one step at a time because I don't know what I'm going to be like on the day. Like this morning, oh, I've got to go to Barclays. <laughs> I've got to do a big talk. My anxiety level is going to be sky high. But I had to overcome it. I had to think, you know what, how can I show up today and give my best version of myself and it all starts with trusting yourself trusting you that whatever will happen will happen and whatever will be will be you have to trust yourself like right now i'm literally skydiving and i'm hoping the parachute will open i open that i don't 
you know, crashing away down when I'm telling you these stories. You know what I mean? It's all about trusting yourself, and that's a big thing when it comes to mental health. Because if you can't trust yourself, you're in a bad place, and that's when you should really reach out and ask for help, talk to people, really just talk, because it's talking that will become your therapist. And there's nothing wrong or anything to be ashamed of, of talking, because I have a therapist that I talk to on a weekly basis that helps me get myself on track, helps me express myself, helps me talk to, to her about things that I might not be able to talk to my mum and dad about, I might not be able to talk to my friends about, so there's nothing wrong with that. So moving back onto my story, my journey, I ended up getting an unconditional offer to go to Salford University and I wasn't unsure about university because I wanted to work in TV industry. So what I did was I started picking up the phones and sending out the emails and promoting myself to try and get a job in the TV industry, which I successfully did. And I got the opportunity to work with people like Lorraine Keller, Amir Khan, Team GB, just to name a few. And it was a really exciting time for me because on the outside I was successful, but on the inside I wasn't so successful because I was deteriorating. I had all this stress from university saying to me that I've got to stay the course and, and stay in university and it's more important than the work. I had my workmate saying to me, drop the degree, get in what you're doing, stick with what you're doing, you're doing good, you're already in the gang, carry on, crack on. And I had all these different messages getting sent to me and the pressure of my parents who really wanted me to get a degree because my brother had just got a degree with my first, so there's that high level stress there, there's a lot of expectations of me to try and go and pursue the same thing. I had toxic friendships at the time that I didn't realise was toxic for me. I had toxic personal relationships but was not great for me. And a lot of toxic things and stress in my life because I was running so fast towards my dreams that I lost that metaphorical oxygen in my brain which made me crash and fall into the deep waters of psychosis which was a breakdown, a mental health breakdown at the age of like 19. So, what happened to me next was, I ended up getting sectioned and I got rushed to a and &E, I threw a blue pill down my neck, and before you knew it, I was in Alice in Wonderland in my eyes. <laughs> it was a very scary time. And this is what it was like when I got sectioned up. There's me in a and &E there, thinking I'm Bane or something out of Batman. <laughs> There's me thinking I'm the next big business entrepreneur of the world, and there's me, don't even know what I'm doing there, I'm just <laughs> chilling. But, you know, I'm, I, was, I was in this place, this very dark place. I know it might seem a little bit like I and you can look back and laugh at these pictures now, but at the time it was a very serious thing to be in. You know what I mean? Because when I got into hospital the first time, like, it was hard, it was scary. Didn't know where my family was. Because when I got put into a, into, into a mental health hospital, I got rushed there in an ambulance, but I was unconscious because the pill knocked me out. And that was the reality of the situation. But what I did was, was start to look around and wonder what was going on. I thought, I was, no matter, the matter of how serious my situation was, I thought that I had died and gone to heaven. That's how scary it was. I was looking to my left and I thought, are they the three wise men? Is that Jesus Christ walking the ground naked or what, you know what I mean? I was like, what's going on here? And then the penny started to drop for me after a few weeks of being unwell and thinking in this delusional way. It was about three o'clock in the morning and I heard somebody on the phone to a takeaway house, right? And he was screaming down the phone going, I'm in a mental asylum! I was like, oh my God, the shock hit me. It was like something out of a horror film. I thought, oh my God, I can't believe I'm locked in here. This is where we actually are. That's when the penny dropped for me. And I thought, no way am I in there. No way am I locked up with these people who are doing all these strange behaviours and these strange beliefs and these strange things. And I'm meant to be like one of them. Nah, don't think so. So I picked up the phone and I said, listen, mum, dad, what have you done putting me in there? I said, Jack, you're seriously unwell. There's been a lot of things happening. What, well, not you, but it's not gonna be all right. You're gonna get better. And they came and rushed to see me as quick as they could. Right? So, after that, I started to look around and realise, I started to look at other people in the hospital and thought, you know what, how can I get myself out of here for one? How can I get better? And how can I help these people in here who are suffering with really unforeseen, difficult, extreme circumstances? Because there was people in there who were trying to commit suicide on a daily basis. And I can still hear the screams, 
and it's not a nice experience to sort of experience just from the outside and it's sad and there's people in there with extreme depression and people in there with all different types of mental health problems so I started saying to them, you know what I said you can become anything you want in this life that you can become anything I said you've all got the spirit of a lion and that's when the doctors came running up to me and said Jack do you believe you're a lion? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, I'm not Simba, I'm not Mufasa, or whatever it may be. I said, I believe we've all got the spirit of a lion. So we've all got the strength of a tiger, or a bear, whatever the animal be, may be. We've all got the spirit of strength inside us. And that's what I was trying to pass on to these people in there in that hospital. I was trying to give them as much help as I could. And what helped me in there was holding on to a vision as well. That if I can get through this, if I can give them the motivation, the inspiration and the empowerment by saying to them, you can become whatever it is that you want in this world. And if you're in a dark time right now, let me be the North Star. Let me guide you through it. Because if I can get through it, you can get through it. And whatever your dreams and goals are, don't disregard them as being unrealistic. Don't disregard them as being delusional. Don't listen to the doctors tell you and stop you from having a dream. Because if you've not got an intention you know, to hurt anyone, you know, if you've got no intention to hurt anyone, You've got no intention to do anything wrong. No one should stop you from having your, your dream. No matter how big it is. No matter how high in the sky it might be. Because that dream is what motivates you. It's what inspires you. It's what makes you get up in the morning when you're dealing with your mental health problems. And that can help you get on along the way. It really can. It can really make a difference in your life having that dream. So all, all those doctors are out there to make you better. To make you more grounded. To help you get back on track. Hold on to your dream. And don't... No matter who it is, no matter if it's the, the mayor, the president, your boss, your wife, your colleague, your kids, whatever dream you got, don't let them disregard your dream. Don't let them take it from you because it's yours. So holding on to my vision, I started in, in, in hospital. I was like, right, how do we get out of it? And I started writing things down on the board, like, right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna inspire people. Like, that'll motivate me. I'm gonna try and talk and share my story. Right, that'll motivate me. I started doing everything I could to get myself well again. So after 19 days, I got out. And it was the longest 19 days of my life. And then, I'm not gonna lie to you guys, life hit me on the blind side for the second time. My relationship of five years had ended. Now we had a, a broken mind and a broken heart at the same time. And it was a very difficult and hard situation to go through. Because whether you've got a mental health problem or not, you will suffer a lot of stress and a lot of distress when you're going through a relationship breakdown. And it's really important for you to stay strong in these times because that's when you're most vulnerable. You're most vulnerable to you know, thinking that negative and extreme thoughts. You're most vulnerable to doing stupid things that do not have a positive impact on you. So you have to stay strong in these situations. So, moving on from there, I had it hard looking back and thinking to myself, I thought, you know, how can I get through this relationship breakdown? I've not got that many friends, I'm isolated, I'm scared to talk to the mates that I do have because I don't want them to know that I've got this mental health problem that I've just been through. I'm scared to go to the shop because I'm, I'm like, you know, what if someone sees me who, who knows me? What if someone's going to ask me anything? All these different thoughts and stories we tell ourselves in our head. And it took me a good six months to get off the couch. Six months just sat there. It was a, it was a battle and ordeal to get from my bedroom to the couch downstairs. I was like so scared, I was so like vulnerable at that time. I'd even sleep in my parents' bedroom. That's how scared I was, scared to be on my own. So it was a big massive step for me to becoming the person that's seen me as today, standing in front of all you guys. I've been on a massive journey and it's not ended. So from there, I ended up getting, you know, how can I get myself out of this rut that I'm in? Started looking back at my dreams. I started thinking, have I given up or is it just on pause? So it was time for me to hit play on my dreams. And what I did was, I said, Jack, this goal you have of being an author, you need to make it happen. You need to do something about it. Because you can't let it sit there and collect dust any longer. And more rejection letters after rejection letters. So what I had to do was get laser focused like a sniper almost. I had the dream in my eyes. I had it in my scopes. I could see where I wanted to go. So I picked on the publisher that I wanted to work with. I picked up the phone. 
and I can feel my body shaking as I'm on the phone. I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, what am I doing? What am I doing? Hey, Mr. Publisher, it's me, Jack. I was wondering if I could send you a, a copy of my book and see what you think. That was the first phone call, and that was a big, massive step for me picking up that phone. It was scary because I had no idea what to expect on the other end. And after a few battles and a few weeks that went by, a period of five weeks, I got more and more determined. I was reading a few times that week, and each time knowing that I was going to fail, but I thought, I'm going to give it another swing. I'm going to give it another swing. I'm going to keep moving forward. I'm going to see if I can sell him my dream. After five weeks, we got a meeting in Manchester, and he brought a contract. And it was like something out of a film. It's something that doesn't happen for a kid from North Manchester like me at a young age, getting presented with a, a contract to publish a book. Now this contract wasn't going to make me JK Rowling overnight, but it was a step in the right direction. Three months later, we had a publishing partner and we sold over a hundred books in one night. Now, that's not a big number, but it was a, it was a lot to me because it was a hundred people's lives that I had touched and impacted in a positive way. And it really made me realise, wow, this is what I can do when I've got a positive mental attitude, when I've got the right determination and the right focus. But on these you know, journeys to getting where I was, I was anxious, I was scared, I was afraid of what could happen. But I had to get through it, and the way I got through it was by focusing on the dream, by visualising where I wanted to be, by listening to positive messages and sending myself positive affirmations and, and, and giving me that positive self-talk and talking to my parents about where I'm going. So, after that experience, I believed I was back on top. I thought, you know what, I like this. Oh, I've got the book, you know, and I was walking around there and I was signing them all and it was, I was really going, yeah, you know, I'm on top of the world, I'm back, I'm back on track. And then, after, um, you know, riding that success and sharing my story with people online and really trying to inspire people and tell my story and give as much as I could, I started to get a little bit of paranoia. Because I was hearing things on the streets that the people that I looked up to, the friends that I had, was making criminal moves. And it really started to impact my mental health massively. Ever so slowly, but it, it, it turned out massive in the end. It was like a slow rise building up. I was getting all delusional thoughts in my head, thinking that someone was going to kill my friend. I thought, you know, something bad was going to happen. I thought my house was going to, you know, all these different things where you, your mind starts to play on you because you start getting paranoid about people doing the wrong things. And especially it upsets you when it's people you look up to. I got really upset and distressed. And before you know it, I was back in hospital for the second time. And when I was in that hospital situation, I had to go back to my roots, and that was helping people. So whilst I was in there, I started saying to people the same messages, you can become whatever it is that you want in this world, what you want in this life, no matter what you're going through, I can help you get through the situation because I've been through it before, I know what's going on, I know there's a way out, and we will get through this way out together. You know, whether that means we've got to go hand in hand together through them doors, we will get through that situation as one. And I was saying that to him, I was saying all these positive messages. You know, these are some of the people who was helping. As you can see, I wasn't in a great place on this photo here, but neither was my friend with me at the time, you know what I mean? We wasn't in the worst situation together, but we was like a team. We was putting everything we could into getting ourselves in a positive mental attitude, into feeling grounded, into feeling, you know, relaxed and calm and trying to get through the anxieties and the distress that we was going through. So, from there, after a few days, not a few days, a few weeks, I started to get like, you know, good bit. It's a bit like prison, you know, when you get good behaviour, you get to get more luxuries in, like, in the prison or whatever. But I started to get leave, and that was, that was where they let me go out of the hospital for a couple of hours. So I'd go out to the local shops, you know, buy bear sweets and that, and bear chocolate bars. And I just wanted to make the, the place, that hospital, a little bit better. So I tried to turn it into like Charlie and a chocolate factory. Mm -hmm. So I gave out chocolate bars and sweets and started trying to create that positive atmosphere for everyone and started giving out poems to them and just really giving it everything I could to help them people in there. And that was therapy for me. That was helping me come back to who I was as, as I was holding some of my dreams and my aspirations in there as well. So this leads me onto owning who you are. When I was in that hospital, I had to own who I was. I write down who I was as a person and really tell myself who I am because I started to become a little bit delusional again and I had to get through these delusions and become who I was as a person again. And I knew who I was, you know, I was a winner. I was a champion in my eyes and I just had to wait for the world to catch up and see that in me. So I was giving it everything I've got. 
And then I ended up getting out, which was a very big thing for me. I was in there from about a month this time, and it was still a long process to go through. But when I got out, I was like, yes. <laughs> it was a massive achievement for me just to get out because the doctor said to you, it could be in there for about a year. I mean, imagine being stuck in a mental health hospital for a year. It's a very long time. It is a bit like a sentence, you could say. But I got out in short time and I, I bounced back quite quickly. But I was still 100% and it took a long way. It, it took me a long time to get back on track for who I was and the person. As I'd lost so much time being unwell, and then going through these circumstances and situations that I was facing. So, what I did was, I had to go back to my roots and think, I had to give myself a purpose, Jack. So I started writing my second book called Dead Ends, which is due to be released in December, so I'm not going to do a little plug or anything, but I just like, you know, <laughs> yeah, you better not buy it now, Jack. <laughs> I don't know what you are, I'll buy it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, I was like, you know, getting myself back on track, giving myself a purpose to wake up for in the morning. Started writing, started trying to get, you know, back in TV and stuff like that, and started working like, in like a documentary production company. And then my dad said to me, why don't you um, go to a mental health charity, Jack? And I was like, me go to a mental health charity? I thought, nah, it's not for me that. I can save myself. That's what we all think. I can help myself with the situation. But you know what? There's no shame in asking for help. And it took me a long time to realise that. My dad said to me, look Jack, it can help you this. My mum said to me, come on Jack, you can get yourself going there. You'll, you'll end up running the place before you know it. So I went, right, okay, well, I took a bold step in the right direction. And I started going there, volunteering there, and I started communicating with the people in there, and I started learning all different types of things from all the different types of people. And I started to connect with like-minded individuals who had been through similar experiences to what I had been through myself, and it was great, you know what I mean, I learned so much, I, be, I became more confident, and when opportunities arise, I got the opportunity to speak at like a place like Camelot and Fahir, for instance, you know what I mean, it really opened the doors for me, because when big people started coming into the organisation, before I knew it, I was selling myself to these people, selling the story without realising, I was giving so much passion and my belief into what the work it is that I'm doing, I did not realise that I would be here. You know what I mean? And I wrote it down, if you go back, it, there we go, no, try and find it. Oh, going backwards a bit. But I wrote it down on this board there that I will do talks, and this is what was called delusional behaviour at the time. And it was really like something that I believed in. I didn't know I was going to get there, but I've got it because I'm speaking to you guys today. And it just goes to show you in life, you don't know which way you're going to turn, but some way, if you've got the vi vision and the dream, you'll connect the dots. In despite of how you feel, <laughs> in despite of what's going on the inside, you'll connect them dots and you will find a way to fulfill whatever it is, what your mission is in life. So, who have I become? I've become an author, a speaker, a creative, and all different types of things. So, it's been a journey for me and it's been an exciting one, but it's not over yet because what I'm trying to do is share with you the things that I've learned and the tips and techniques that I apply every single day to try and get myself on top. So what do I do to combat my health condition, bipolar, depression and diet? Faith is the first one. I have to have faith in myself that everything's going to be okay. No matter what happens in life, no matter where it leads, I have to have faith in myself and it goes back to the, the foundation of trusting me. I have to have faith in me, Jack Nolan, because if I don't, then I won't be able to communicate my message. I won't be able to perform or perform. I won't be able to talk the way I talk. It all comes back <coughs> down to faith, which leads me on to self-belief. Self-belief is massive for mental health, and it doesn't get talked about too much, because everyone says, you know, the, the, the basics. <coughs> no one's talking about the importance of that self-belief that it takes of raising and your self-esteem and building and developing your confidence within who you are. Because if you don't do these things, you might fall short of who you can become. So, I'm going to lead that leads me on to courage. It takes courage to stand on the stage. It takes courage to talk to your boss about how you're feeling. It takes courage to talk to your kids, your wife, your husband, whoever it may be. It takes courage to just talk and open up with 
you know, what's going on in your life. That all takes courage and that's something that I have to develop within myself.